<laughs> well, good evening, everybody. My name is Brian Elliott. I'm the SLA student group uh, president. I'm welcoming tonight uh, Rachel Barrington, who's going to speak on alternative careers for librarians. Uh, Rachel is the director of IEEE's client services. And um, she was president of the Oregon chapter of Special Libraries Association 2002 to 2003. She's also a member of IEEE's inaugural Library Advisory Council from 1999 to 2001. And she's an active member of both the SLA and ASEE's Engineering Libraries Division. Uh, Rachel, thank you very much for agreeing to do this for our group. And uh, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, and I appreciate having the opportunity to chat about this. This is going to certainly be my experience uh, of, of what I have done with my um, my MLS and also um, some stories from my team. So I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about my current employer, IEEE, and who we are. Um, IEEE stands for the Institute for Electrical and Electronics Engineers. We are the world's largest professional membership association and currently we have uh, over 430,000 members around the world. Uh, and that's including about 120,000 student members at the moment. Um, what we do basically is, um, of course, uh, manage that membership. And um, I work for the, the publishing arm of IEEE. Um, we publish journals, magazines, standards, and conferences. Um, the conferences are run by um, uh, volunteers that, um, you know, basically uh, do regional conferences and big international conferences around the world. There's, I think they say, something like three IEEE conferences a day. <laughs> and then some people know us primarily as a standards association, um, industry standards such as 802.11, the Wi-Fi standard, Bluetooth. Um, we have power and energy standards, um, ele electrical codes, etc. cetera. And um, that's a big part of what we do. Education runs the um, range from uh, getting young students excited about engineering to, uh, you know, uh, obviously helping out in the university level and then also continuing education for working engineers. So uh, we have a, a variety of publications uh, and, um, and education materials. Currently, we have about 160 journals and magazines. Uh, and um, pretty much just all of the technology, not just electrical engineering and computing. And we continue to add new journals every year. So basically, uh, we're a membership-run association. The, we have 37 technical societies. Uh, and every year, some of the societies will, will um, basically uh, ask to add an additional title, and the board of directors will um, approve that or not. So we continue to add new titles based on what is currently, um, you know, a hot topic, cloud computing, smart grid, uh, biometrics, um, computer security, and things like that um, are, are new titles for us. And uh, we continue to add journals and magazines uh, when we have a lot of submissions in a certain subject area. Com conference proceedings. Um, are looked at, in our space at least, as the most current information. A lot of times a brand new technology is first introduced at an IEEE conference. Uh, it's a quick way to get your, uh, your research public. Um, journals take a lot longer to publish, so from submission to publication, there's usually a substantial wait. But for conferences, that is a lot shorter. So a lot of times, we look at conference literature as extremely cutting edge. Um, Two thirds of our content is conference literature. Uh, so again, the standards another big part. Um, we have educational courses as well, as I mentioned, and we're starting to have um, some ebooks collections. And all of these are available uh, on the IEEE Explore website, which is our platform to deliver all of our, uh, our information in full text. And um, this is just sort of a look at who our uh, customers are. And um, of course, 
uh, tech companies are, are um, a big amount of, of our users. There are indeed departments of you know telecom companies, semiconductor companies, uh, aerospace communications, computer services, and then of course um, universities is um, our biggest bulk of customers. I would think we have all of the top engineering schools in the U.S. Um, and then 97 of the top 100 technical universities around the world. And then government is another huge subscriber to our digital library, um, defense agencies, aerospace, uh, military, patent offices, etc. So um, that's just a snapshot of who uses our information. So um, basically, I uh, you started out as more of a traditional librarian. There we go. Um, so how did I get to IEEE? Uh, this is uh, when I first started at uh, University of Arizona when I was in the library science program there. Um, they had a student chapter that was, they had a student chapter, but the, the, um, hadn't, been, hadn't organized anything for quite some time. So uh, a few students and myself decided to um, rejuvenate the student chapter. And I became president because no one else would. And um, the great thing about that was going for lots, going to lots of tours. And at that point, I was very interested uh, in, in maybe becoming a corporate librarian um, or some sort of um, newspaper librarian. I was actually thinking of being a newspaper librarian until I realized that there's not that many newspaper librarians uh, in the United States, two or three per city. And those people tend to hold on to their jobs until retirement. So that that idea went out the window. Um, anyway, but that was a great way for me to um, get an idea of the kinds of jobs that were out there uh, is um, being a, an active uh, volunteer for the student chapter there in Tucson. Received my MLS, and um, I had left Oregon to go get my MLS. This is before, I think, University of Arizona became uh, well, there was there was no way for me to get a purely um, distance MLS at that point from from the state of Oregon. You guys are lucky you can uh, attend um, from a distance for your program. So I received my MLS in 1998, moved back to Portland, and pretty much applied for every open library job that I saw. Um, SLA was a big part of how I got hired at Mentor Graphics, um, and Mentor Graphics is a electronic design automation company in Portland. Uh, they have one corporate librarian, about 3,000 employees worldwide, uh, and the corporate librarian um, that was there in 97 and early 98 um, was leaving to go actually to Intel. But I had met her at a local Oregon event, um, and actually she had done a tour of the Mentor Graphics corporate library um, before she left. And I met um, some of the uh, researchers there. I kind of got an idea as to the collection and the type of work that Mentor Graphics do, does. So when I actually got a, a, an interview, that was a huge leg up for me, um, just having been there and really, um, you know, certainly not understood everything, but understood um, the basic uh, mission of that library really helped a lot. And um, as my first professional job out of library school, that was a, a, a huge lucky um, move for me. So I'm um, very happy to get that position. Um, being a corporate librarian, being a solo librarian was a, a lot of work, but I remember the first thing that I did was I took actually um, a circuit design course. And um, I'm certainly not an engineer, and I'm not an electrical engineer, but I wanted to understand the language. And I think that's some advice that I have for everybody is that uh, a lot of times when you are um, looking at some of these uh, subject specialty positions, um, it's maybe some positions um, require, uh, you know, an, um, the education behind it. But a lot of times, it's just a matter of being able to understand the requests and speak the language. And I looked at it as that way. It's a, it's a language. If I can understand the basics of the technology and, and ask a lot of questions, um, the researchers that I was working with were more than happy to help. Uh, and I can, you know, certainly um, manage to at least show them that um, 
I was willing to work hard and 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 um, help them with their searching, et cetera. So um, after that, I did run for Oregon chapter president of the SLA and and got that. So very active in the SLA during my years at Mentor Graphics. I also joined the um, Society for Competitive Intelligence Professionals when I was a corporate librarian. And then something happened in the year 2000. Again, SLA had something to do with that. Uh, somebody was asked to join the inaugural Library Advisory Council for IEEE, the first one that they ever had uh, here in Oregon, I, as she was, I think, at the Tektronics Library at that point, and couldn't make it and suggested me. And um, I was on that advisory council for three years and got to know basically the people that would hire me and, and um, called up when they decided they wanted to hire librarians and, and that's how I got here. So um, the path that I took once I, once I was hired by IEEE, I was first hired um, to be basically a trainer um, for the digital library. So I was the Western manager, I think they called it uh, customer relations actually back then in 2002. Um, my territory was Western US and Canada. Uh, and then I was promoted to senior manager as my team got bigger, and now my team's even larger, and I'm the director, and I don't really have much of a territory anymore, although I still do have Oregon and um, support the universities and some of the customers here in Oregon, um, but mostly I am um, the director of a program. And our mission is, you know, the, the grand mission is to promote scholarly publishing worldwide um, to show, you know, why is peer review important? Uh, why do you look at authoritative sources, you know? Um, then secondarily to train and build awareness of the, of the digital library. It's a, you know, the access that um, we offer is subscription. It's not inexpensive, so we want to make sure that the libraries that purchase subscriptions to our content um, uh, understand what they have access to. Uh, you know, we really like to talk to end users, researchers, grad students, uh, engineers as, as well, and make sure they understand um, what they have access to and how do you get the most out of their access. Uh, we also partner with a marketing department uh, at IEEE to help um, make sure that we've got uh, search assistance information. We have some online training tools and uh, tutorials and things, and we are pretty much the, um, the creators of all of that type of content. Um, and I, this is one of my favorite things I think we do is we really work with product development and we are looked at as the librarian experts uh, because we do talk to our users and talk to the librarians that um, are, are training their own um, end users at their sites. So we get a lot of feedback and we also get to see a lot of competitive products out there. We get to see a lot of databases and um, even things that are, you know, um, not competitors, you know, not publisher sites, but just uh, tools that librarians are using to organize information. So we get all of this amazing exposure and we bring that back to the uh, product development teams at IEEE and, and help them to guide the path um, for uh, the future for our digital library and some of the things that we offer. We also work uh, very closely with student branches. That's one of probably the most um, uh, rewarding part of all of our jobs is working with these um, IEEE student branches at universities. They're usually very interested to talk to us. Um, they're very curious as to why there's a librarian talking to us, especially when you get outside of the United States. Um, I've definitely been to um, I've been to a student branch meeting in China, and they, uh, the audience said I was the first librarian they'd ever met. <laughs> so um, very unusual, and um, but very rewarding because they're hungry for information and they uh, are very interested in what you have to say. So this is a, a look at my team right now. This is uh, currently my full team. I've got people in the United States. I've got someone in China and someone in India. Um, someone in Berlin. Uh, I've got multiple languages that we do our presentations. We've got someone who speaks Spanish and Portuguese, uh, Mandarin, Cantonese, um, Hindi, um, Hungarian, and German. So um, all of these people have MLSs and library backgrounds. Um, 
some of you may recognize George Plosker. He is a San Jose State University um, alumni. And I think he's spoken to your students before, maybe on a similar topic. And I do want to give a shout out to all of these guys um, that helped me make this presentation because I wanted to share some of their experiences of, of being a librarian that's working for a publisher as well. Here's a look at the global map. Um, I'm sort of floating out in, um, outside of Alaska there, but you see the territories in the US. We've got um, three uh, folks in the US, and then we've got someone that handles Latin America, Spain, and Portugal, um, someone that hand handles all of Europe, and um, uh, Danu is in India, Ching's in China, uh, and then Chris also in the far right, Chris. Fitzpatrick. Um, she uh, is in charge of this university partnership program where we really um, work very closely with um, specific universities around the world um, to give them some um, kind of different types of opportunities working with uh, IEEE as a, as a technical association. So you can go visit our website uh, at the URLs at the bottom of the page, IEEE Go Client Services and get information about the kinds of programs that we do. But I just wanted to give you a, a visual of our team. Um, we travel a lot. And um, as you notice, there are big swaths of the world where there is no CSM assigned, uh, such as Africa and um, the Middle East and Russia. So those are the types of places that my whole team gets to go to when there's a need. Uh, and we've been to some very interesting places. And I'm going to give you a few um, highlights from last year. I thought it would just be interesting to know, you know, what this isn't the day-to-day, -day, but these are some of the things that I think uh, stand out as to highlights of what our team does and how they work with libraries around the world. Um, this was probably the most interesting thing that I think our team has done. Um, Ching Li, my client services manager in Beijing, works really closely with Peking University. Um, they uh, um, wanted to do a scavenger hunt. And I guess scavenger hunts in China are really hit hot right now. In fact, people actually pay to be um, um, attendees at scavenger hunts. They're, they sound kind of like um, sort of like mystery, you have, to, you have to kind of go through these various processes, go through these rooms and check off this checklist. Anyway, the librarian wasn't quite sure whether she wanted to um, do something with the IEEE logo all over it. Um, we talked her into it, and the IEEE student group was, um, you know, did the lead. It wasn't certainly a Ching's, you know, um, brainchild all by herself. The student group helped, and basically we had over 700 attendees, which is probably the most um, attendees that a, a library event had ever had. Well, the library director said, you know, they'd never had so many people walking into the library like this. And it didn't really matter that it was IEEE that was that was sponsoring it. It was just getting people in the library, talking to librarians, and doing something fun. Um, uh, and they got to learn a lot about um, a lot of the databases and, and services that the library has. Uh, in China, it's um, the librarians uh, don't tend to have events like this, so this was certainly a big deal for them, and it really paid off. Um, next slide. This is just a look at um, some of the the marketing material. If you see on the right, uh, this is the in English. It's been translated, but this shows the prizes that were given away, and this, the blackboard just kind of talks about some of the other events that were going on during this week. And the picture is um, the, kind of the entrance of the library. They actually had to have security <laughs> out front because there were so many people waiting in line to participate in this game. So hugely successful um, event. And you know, our whole mission is to um, make the library look good. They've invested a lot of their budget into purchasing a subscription to our content. Um, we want to make sure that they are um, feeling comfortable with you know, um, the co-marketing that we do with them. And we definitely give them a lot of opportunity uh, to talk to their users. And sometimes they need something like this uh, to get them out in front of, um, in front of their users. Uh, obviously, we all know that. Um, people aren't actually physically going to the library as much as they used to. Another thing that our team did last year, um, 
discovery tools are, are certainly being purchased by many, many, many of our customers, um, and not just academic, uh, you know, also government and corporate customers. Uh, libraries are purchasing discovery tools, and, and we were seeing a, a little bit of a disturbing trend that our content wasn't really showing up very well in the discovery tools, and, and it was our team that identified the problem because we were out there um, actually, you know, um, doing demonstrations on site, seeing how some of these implementations of discovery tools were working. Uh, you could have so many different layers. You know, people might buy a link resolver from one vendor, discovery tool from another, different databases from another, and so there's always something. Um, you know, there's never just a standard at all. And so we identified the problem. Um, we helped uh, get product development up to speed as to what we needed to do. And I think we're the first publisher to actually approach these vendors and talk about, um, you know, what can we do to make sure that our content isn't being missed. Uh, and it's really important because librarians are, you know, basically making this their front page now. Uh, in some small schools, it's there's no longer a cataloging link, uh, catalog link at all. There's just a link to um, Summon or um, EBSCO Discovery. So we were concerned about that, but we did some really good work last year. We met with all of the th big three vendors and created this best practices document, um, which we can share with other librarians, showing them how to best um, implement their discovery tool to point to content that they've paid for already, not just ours, but uh, other scientific scholarly literature as well. And our whole team, we were trained on some test searches that we can run when we're on site at a, at a library. And um, we've got this search that, you know, we were, we're looking to make sure that the that our content is showing up. Um, a lot of times it's just because it hasn't been implemented correctly. So those are that's, that's the kind of thing that no one else can really do uh, at IEEE. We're the ones that are at the library actually using um, using library tools on site. And so we get to we are testing some of this stuff out. Um, another thing that we're very concerned with, of course, is usage. You know, um, so we look at uh, usage statistics a lot. And we had this uh, zero use campaign in India. We had uh, a number of customers that had access but were not using it at all, and um, basically uh, it was my team member's job to uh, look at that zero usage, see, come up with strategies to get the word out, a lot of outreach, a lot of regional meetings, um, newsletters, etc. and he managed to um, cut that number of um, non-users um, quite dramatically from 109 to 32. So again, another thing that certainly I'll, the only uh, you know, we're the only people at IEEE that are really able to get out there and, and do this kind of project. And then George Plosker, as I mentioned earlier, one of your uh, alumni um, <laughs> did something quite incredible. And if you guys share this PowerPoint afterwards, you can click on the YouTube video. Um, he was in Azerbaijan, and we don't even have a salesperson in Azerbaijan, but there was a professor that really wanted to get a national license for Azerbaijan, all of the universities very um, interested in getting access to scientific information. Uh, he was invited, the professor was invited to actually come on the morning show, just like the Today Show of Azerbaijan, and sit down with uh, a, a couple of uh, hosts, and they had 10 minutes or maybe even 15 minutes to chat about, you know, why uh, Azerbaijan needs um, in engineering information, <laughs> and it was quite amazing. So uh, if you get this PowerPoint later, you can click on the link and see George did, did an excellent job uh, through the interpreter um, there uh, talking about, um, you know, why the libraries uh, need access to some of this international engineering information. Uh, so we travel a lot. We go to a lot of libraries, and we go to a lot of, and we do a lot of webinars. This is just a snapshot of last year, how many times we're visiting and, and doing webinars. Uh, this is a look at one year of travel. Um, this was a few years ago, and just some, you know, um, kind of unusual countries on the list. It's not just we're not just going to Canada and the UK. We're going all over the place, and. Um, libraries need our content all over the world, so we get to visit some amazing places. 
Um, at IEEE, they don't just hire librarians for our team. You know, I have eight people on my team, and um, but we have uh, also um, people with MLSs working in other groups. Um, one of the IEEE Explorer, that's our digital library, product managers uh, is an, has an MLS. Um, we have sales personnel um, that actually go out and, and do some of the um, sales for Explore, uh, have library backgrounds. Um, we had an archive project um, where we used um, librarian consultants to help identify gaps in our coverage and find the hard copies at libraries around the world so we can make sure that we had all of the content for our back files digitized. Uh, we've got uh, an assistant editor that is a librarian, and also we have, of course, our own corporate librarian at IEEE as well. So for my team, you know, what, what skills are necessary for, for this kind of job? Um, probably most important is being outgoing and approachable. We're out in front of students, in front of librarians, researchers all the time. and. Um, so that's a very important part. We want to um, talk to librarians as peers and um, bring back feedback. Uh, so that, that's a large part of what we do. Um, need to be knowledgeable and responsive and you know, do we, doing a lot of communicating on both an uh, individual level and then also a lot of public speaking and uh, training and workshops and things. Um, so a technical skills. Um, Obviously, we need to be able to thoroughly understand and explain all levels of online search interfaces and data structure. We get asked all sorts of questions about how the search engine algorithms work and um, how to do some you know, very old school uh, command searches with Boolean logic, et cetera. We have to be very uh, up on um, the answers for those types of things. So um, we have to be very knowledgeable there. Um, but also we have to have some you know, good knowledge of what's currently being used in libraries uh, today. So discovery tools is one example, um, you know, bibliographic software tools, all sorts of things. We need to know what happens to our information once it gets out to the libraries and how is it used later, how is it linked to, and what kind of technologies are, are uh, linking to our content. Um, and we need to be able to feel pretty comfortable talking about those topics. Um, we need to be able to provide uh, requirements to our technical teams uh, about what customers need. Right now, authentication is a huge issue for us. We, um, you know, IP authentication is becoming a thing of the past thanks to people getting to their library content through mobile devices and being off-site all the time. Um, you know, VPN, proxy servers, and IPs can only bring us so far. So um, we're very engaged with the um, uh, with um, some of our customers about you know, what is the next levels of authentication for online products and online databases. And then we work alone. We travel alone a lot. Um, we also go uh, and have to do uh, demonstrations and training, and we find ourselves in some interesting situations. And uh, my whole team works remotely. I'm in Portland, Oregon right now, um, and uh, I will work from here. I will work from um, foreign countries, on the road, et cetera. So we're out there and not, not a lot of support um, from IEEE headquarters. Uh, and that's usually fine <laughs> until you're having a, a major technical nightmare. But tonight things are working well. Um, so what type of individual succeeds in this kind of environment? Very diplomatic. Uh, you're not, we're not salespeople. We don't talk about pricing or do any sales, but um, we need to be able to um, speak diplomatically and um, talk to different types of groups, not be intimidated by the engineers. Uh, these people are super smart. I learned this at Mentor Graphics when I took this, that circuit design course that, you know, I'm not an engineer and I certainly don't pretend to be one, um, but, uh, you know, I have to be able to speak to them and, uh, you know, basically gain their respect. Uh, and I would find you know, that engineers in general um, are, are very supportive of libraries. Um, and that's why it seems like those corporate libraries, engineering corporate libraries, are still, uh, still alive in many places, and others seem to be closing. Um, 
comfortable with learning curves and enjoying the ride. That is certainly um, part of all of my team's strong points as we get asked to do the you know, craziest things like George on the morning show and uh, we've got to roll with it and um, I think that uh, sometimes we look at ourselves as uh, like content evangelists. We're just trying to promote that uh, you need good information and of course we're talking about it coming from IEEE but um, we talk we talk about, um, you know, why do you need publishers, why do you need authority, authoritative sources, etc. Um, so that's something that uh, we talk in, in all sorts of forums. Um, some trends that we see, uh, of course, huge growth in Asia. They're becoming our number one authors. Uh, China, I think, will surpass uh, the rest of the world in authorship of technical papers in the next 15 years. So um, they are using the content, they're using information, and they're also creating a lot of information as well. Uh, Change your user ex changing user expectations. I don't need to tell you guys that, but um, certainly people are expecting things to happen quicker, sooner, uh, um, and easier uh, at the click of a button from anywhere in the world on any kind of device. Um, there's also, of course, a need for lots of outreach uh, and some targeted communication. People just don't necessarily know their librarians anymore. They don't necessarily walk into the library and ask for help. In fact, reference desks are closing, and so people like us uh, are relied upon to bridge that gap sometimes, and we're lucky that we have membership. We have actual IEEE members throughout the world that are willing to be our champions and help us talk to our users, um, and sometimes there are no librarians, especially in corporate set settings and some government settings as well. No one needs training. Uh, that's something we always hear, especially at a corporate uh, in, in the companies, people, we try to have these training events and nobody shows up. Well, they show up if we provide food sometimes, but um, they, everyone believes that they are expert searchers now. And so we either have to convince them that they're going to get something uh, new and interesting out of joining us for a half hour or keep it really short, really targeted, um, and uh, try to get their attention. Sometimes we have to work with different departments in the library, such as like training and, and benefits and all sorts of things like that. Um, Pop-up library is, is something that works really well for us. So uh, I was actually in Ireland last week and as one of my staff was doing training in a traditional like instructional classroom, uh, me and another uh, person, the, actually the salesperson for the UK, had set up a table outside of the um, coffee shop and uh, just people walking by, chatting with them, and man, the, the awareness was very low at these in these Irish universities, um, and we we got to spread the word uh, just by having a table set up. This works great um, all all around the world. In University of Washington, the engineering librarian goes to the engineering building once a week, and she just has a little stand set up with a laptop, and that's the way she keeps in touch with her users. Uh, also, a lot of um, times we're talking about authorship, how to publish, how to get a paper accepted, um, get through the peer review process, what it all means. Um, this is a really big topic. It gets us in the door often uh, if we talk about uh, how to be an author uh, as well as how to search for information. So there's a great need for information on how to author. Um, Always improving. This is something my whole team does a lot of continuing education about. You know, public. We can always, all of us, be better at public speaking, um, networking, partnering with organizations. You know, not only within our customer sites, but also other associations, other um, sister organizations. Um, you know, we uh, uh, internally to IEEE. I still have to do a lot of marketing of what we're doing, why we're around, why. We're traveling around the world and representing this, you know, this organization. Um, and then we've got to continue to be in touch with our customers and understand those new technologies. Plus, be very familiar with what um, our guys are doing in the technical, uh, you know, the explore development guys that are coming up with the next big feature that we need to end up training people on. 
So, you know, why does, why does my team love it? Well, we're very passionate about the IEEE mission, which is advancing technology for humanity. Um, a lot of us like to tell the stor stories about um, some of the humanitarian goals that IEEE has. We all kind of find our hook of things that we like to talk about to, um, to people when we have uh, the opportunity. Um, we do get to meet a lot of really smart people and visit a lot of um, amazing libraries around the world and, and see what um, other cultures are doing. And, and that is why a lot of people are very surprised when they find out that I'm a librarian when I meet people at the airport and tell them I'm I'm going to Zambia, <laughs> and uh, they're very surprised to hear that I'm proudly admitting to being a librarian. Um, there's not um, many, um, I don't think, publishers uh, uh, that probably have the team the size of ours with um, the type of travel that we do. Uh, I know that many other scientific publishers have trainers, um, people with library backgrounds, but we are doing so much more than that, and, and we are traveling so much more than that. It's, it's really um, pretty amazing. A uh, big part of my team's and, and my own personal um, belief is that volunteering um, helps in all aspects of your job and helps you with networking. Uh, this is you know, some of the people on my team that have um, taken up volunteer roles with the SLA. Um, and you know, Ruth is in New Jersey. George is in uh, San Jose area. Jalen is in San Antonio. Uh, Danu is in Bangalore. So we are all. Um, have had volunteer positions with SLA and believe that that's really important. And also, we work for a nonprofit professional association as well. So it's important that we, um, you know, we also show that that's uh, we belong to professional associations in our own area, uh, as well as working for one. So that is my presentation. Um, I've certainly left plenty of time for questions. If uh, anyone has questions. Um, I'm here. Fantastic, Rachel. I just want to thank you again for, for sharing all that. It was a wealth of information. I look forward to seeing the recording of your talk because uh, there was so, it was just so packed. Thank you. <laughs> Good. For the, uh, the questions, uh, why don't you go ahead and raise your hands when you, when you have them and uh, we can do it with the mic or if you want to type into the chat box. Uh, there is a, a hand raising area in the icons just below your name in the participant window. And just to the left of the checkbox is a little hand raiser, and that will set up a queue where you can talk to Rachel directly. So it looks like we may have a question already in the window. Can you read that there, Rachel? Or you want me to read it out loud? Uh, yeah, I can. So I'll, I'll read it. Um, it says I, I have a a question which may not be specific to this presentation, but maybe indirectly. Do you have any tips for a new MLIS student interested in database creation and maintaining coding side of things, but who also has a deep interest in traditional librarianship and uh, have an MA in history? Um, you know, I think with, with APIs, uh, that's the way to go. For right now, you know, IEEE is about to release um, an API. That means people can do what they will with the metadata that we have. And I know a lot of publishers uh, and databases are making um, like XML gateways available, APIs available. Uh, whether or not you have the programming knowledge is, of course, uh, um, that's up for grabs, but you know, finding a programmer and coming up with a concept um, these days to make a, an app or um, any kind of database, there's a lot of um, you know free uh, information out there because people are are willing to um, you know kind of put their stuff out there and allow crowdsourcing to program on their content, um, big data, all that good stuff. So. Um, grab a programmer and find <laughs> find uh, a publisher or um, a data set that allows you to create an API, and that might be an interesting thing to do as a project, either in school or perhaps uh, after you're finished. But if anyone else has, I don't know, Bill or anybody has other more practical um, <laughs> advice, 
um, feel free to chime in. No, that was uh, great, Rachel. That's um, you know the kinds of things you can do, and obviously, um, Laura, I'm not sure where you are in the program, but if you can do some of those kinds of things uh, and incorporate them into assignments as you're going along, uh, then you've got, so yeah, if you just started, then you've got some time to try to develop those skills. and. Uh, you'll be able to use them not only for your portfolio finishing uh, your MLIS program, but have them to show potential employers. <laughs> I just read the next uh, <laughs> chat, which is, might you be hiring for a Russia area, CSM? Uh, at the moment, no, but um, I will. my team will be expanding again next year. Um, right now, we don't have a lot of activity in Russia. Um, the Middle East and Singapore area um, probably need another CSM in India. So what I usually do when I have a position open is um, I post it on LinkedIn. Uh, it always goes up on the IEEE site, but I definitely post it at the library schools. That's where I found my CSM in China is she was getting her PhD at Syracuse University um, and planning to go back to China, which was just perfect. Um, so sometimes, sometimes there is a language need which makes it very hard for me to fill these positions. Uh, I want someone with the library experience plus um, foreign language skills. So. Um, you know, link in with me. Actually, let me show my next slide. Oh, it doesn't have a link. But there's my email address. Um, I'm not accepting resumes at the moment, but um, that Twitter, I triple Rachel, uh, it might be worth following that. And I certainly talk about job openings when I have them, and uh, you know, watch your job boards. But I, I do use the San Jose and UW and and variety of um, student. Uh, job boards when, when I do have an opening. So um, was there another one? Let's see. Uh, okay, do I know any language other than English myself? I do speak some Spanish, but I certainly could not give a, a, an engineering presentation in Spanish. Um, and so I did hire somebody <laughs> that speaks fluent. Spanish uh, and um, Portuguese. Um, yes, I wish I spoke Chinese because that's the one place when I go to China, which is a couple times a year, I'm very fortunate that I have um, a colleague there that helps me out. But if I'm not with her uh, and I'm not in a big city and I'm walking around, it's yeah, it's very difficult. And of course, you can't read anything either. Um, but uh, Luckily, like I said, I, I'm usually traveling with a colleague. Um, I get by pretty well most places, and um, I bring like a you know my uh, Lonely Planet um, phrase book and making a fool out of myself trying to pronounce things. I think that's another part of the job. All of us are pretty you know outgoing, and I've been to some places that are not on the top 10 list for my, you know, that I would never expect to go, and I've, always, and I've had an amazing time. So just a very open mind. Um, but again, you know, uh, going to visit libraries really helps, because making friends with librarians is certainly uh, the same the world over. But we're all kind of in the, the same uh, mindset. Um, Engineering level is engineering level language necessary or enough to get by and know when the professional translation is in the accurate. Uh, I, are you talking about? I think are you talking about translated engineering papers, or are you talking about me learning? Uh, very, I mean, my team learning basic engineering language. I'm not sure about that one. If you're talking about, um, you know, do we all speak basic like engineering? I would say we all have our strengths, and we choose kind of to be excited about something. Luckily, IEEE is so broad. So, like for instance, um, I was sort of obsessed with autonomous robotic vehicles for a while, and I felt like I, I read a lot of the um, the articles about it, and I felt like even though I'm not an engineer, I kind of understand 
um, some of the basics about control and autonomous vehicles, et cetera, I felt like I could do those searches and show off a little bit. But man, if somebody shows me, um, you know, printed circuit board, uh, transistors and converters and wants to do a really complex, yeah, I will certainly show them that I am clueless when it comes to a lot of that stuff. So we, we kind of focus on things that we can understand and all of us have our strengths depending on just kind of personal And that's kind uh, of an example of uh, of your commu- using your communication skills again, correct? You're kind of negotiating those questions. Yeah, and that's, I mean, you know, if you've all taken reference 101, the informational interview is just that. You're trying to figure out uh, what the person's looking for, and you certainly um, may not be an expert you know, and you can still point them to information because you know how to do the search and you know the fields and metadata and the difference between, um, you know, uh, doing a proximity search and this and that. So you have something to give to the conversation for sure and you have to, of course, uh, make that very clear. Um, But like I said earlier, these days people are certainly under the impression that they're all expert searchers and they are always finding what they need. And um, I love showing someone that they might not be. (laughs) So that's that's the fun part. We're not pompous about it, but we certainly like it when someone says, wow, I had no idea that I could do that. Absolutely. I've had that. I work in a medical library, so I'm not a specialist. I'm not a doctor. So I have those situations on occasion where it's, can you tell me more about that? I, you know, being open and saying, I don't understand, please educate me so that I can help you with what I do know. Right. And a lot of times it's doing this, doing a search, showing them a bunch of search results and saying, which one of these is closest to what you're looking for? And having them, you know, being patient, having them look at the results. Uh, and then picking out one and going, this is actually what I'm looking for, and then kind of taking a step back and looking at index terms for that article, the keywords, reading the abstract, and, um, you know, it's not supposed to be super speedy. (laughs) You have to kind of look into it and do a little work there, but someone's taking reference right now. Well, informational interviews, definitely we all still use that. I think I've answered, let's see, okay, I think I've answered these questions so far, definitely reference, I mean, we, and the funny thing is, is, you know, I remember taking cataloging at University of Arizona, I'm thinking, oh my god, I'm never going to be a cataloging librarian, <laughs> never, ever, and somehow when I worked at IEEE, I became like the cataloging expert, you know, just because I was the one person that you know, remembered what I learned about MARC records and and people still come to me and ask for cataloging help and I'm thinking, well, how did I get to be a cataloging <laughs> expert? But that's, that's the beauty of, of, you know, this is, um, I my whole team, we are the, you know, the librarians on staff and so they'll ask us all sorts of questions. They'll ask us, um, uh, you know, stuff that we learned, <laughs> stuff that you did learn in library school all the time. Uh, looks like there's a question about open access. So let's see, I'm just going up, make sure I didn't miss this one. So open access is, of course, um, you know, a huge deal uh, for any scholarly publisher. Um, and we do have plans, and but we're not quite sure what the future is. To tell, I mean, no one, no one is, and I think it's going through a phase right now, and we are all learning together. Um, you know, uh, for years we are, were a green open access publisher, meaning that uh, any author could post the um, uh, their article on an institutional repository or um, on their own personal website. And then that was super uh, generous because that was even the published version. <laughs> and then a few years ago we changed that to, no, it has to be the preprint version, not the published version. So that that limited that a little bit, but still they can post the preprint. And then um, I think three, two years ago, we made every IEEE journal a hybrid open access journal 
Uh, so anybody that submits a paper to any of our journals can decide upon submission whether they want to publish it under the traditional publishing model or under open access. So um, that that was a big deal, but our, our uptake on open access is low in that setting. So last year in February, we rolled out a mega journal. <laughs> we call it a mega journal, which means it spans all of the various subject areas of IEEE and even then some, as long as it's under some kind of scope of uh, technology. It, and it's called IEEE Access. And uh, I think we have, I, I need to get a current count, but we've got about 600 papers in that, which is less than we expected for the first year, but still pretty good. Um, the beauty of it is certainly that uh, it, was, it will go from submission to publication very quickly. I think our metric is we want it to be from submission through peer review to publication in 45 days, which is well, that's um, fast. You know, pretty uh, very, very fast. I don't know whether we hit that mark every time, but um, we have uh, you know a huge amount of peer reviewers you know in the. Um, standing by for these things, and, and we have a, uh, a good editor, and, you know, we'll kind of have to wait and see, and we're also starting an open access, like, to sell open access tokens, basically, to big universities, and I think the only country that's really taking us up on that is the UK, because they have mandates about this stuff. So, we're, you know, we're certainly in the mix, we're using, we're trying it out, um, but whether or not this is something that is, this is a phase and will change over time, I don't know. But go check out IEEE Access. You can go to Explore, um, IEEE Explore, and go to um, the journal pages and go to Access. They actually have a lot of video content, too, like, that are submitted with the journals. And there's currently an interesting video about um, uh, robotics in combat. Uh, that goes with the PDF um, of the article. I think it's, um, you know, it, it, we're hoping that the the articles in that open access journal are more applied rather than theoretical. So we might attract more people that are um, maybe not the you know PhD level electrical engineers to read that content. Interesting. It looks like Basha's got uh, a question to ask. Go ahead and grab the mic, Basha. Well, thank you, um, Rachel. I am. Well, I don't even know where to start because I have so many questions for you, but um, some of them maybe we can talk about later. For example, I am very curious about the um, best practices for linking and discovery tools or the actual discovery process. I'm having questions and issues with, with, with that myself right now, but that is for a different session. What I really am curious about is you mentioned the new um, ways of authenticating for remote access. And that's something that all libraries are going to be facing or having to address um, in the near future. So I'm, I'm wondering, I'm curious if you could tell us more about it and what are the new, um, if IP is passe, so what's the new way or best way of authenticating resources? Yeah. So. Um, you know, currently we have the ability for IP authentication, username and password, uh, and for our academic customers, we had Shibboleth and Athens, which is that single sign-on um, academic uh, authentication. Now, that has been co-opted by corporates now, and it's called SAML. And SAML is very similar to Shib. I mean, it is the, basically the technology behind Shibboleth and Athens. And um, but companies are starting to use it for their uh, paid content, uh, and we now have actually the first customer ever that is only using SAML to authenticate to um, its online subscription. And beforehand, they were using this weird script that would sign them on as a username and password because they refused to give us our, their IP addresses. So it's probably uh, better than it was before because if people log in in the morning under their single username and password onto their machine. Um, I know at IEEE I log in every morning um, to my email and then I can log into the internet and things and don't have to be on a proxy server or a VPN. Um, now they're actually able to get passed through to um, online databases as well. So SAML is available today. Um, it's, we're still trying to figure out 
if every company is going to be as good at it as this one that I'm talking about, um, which it was, is a success story. Um, we're looking at mobile pairing, but we're worried about that too because um, in the U.S. you usually can't get onto the mobile network um, unless you are a student, you have a username and ID or whatever it is. Um, but overseas, especially China, you walk onto campus and you're getting onto the IP address, and we we worry a lot about abuse and um, you know stealing content and copyright problems, etc. So um, we're we're worried about that mobile pairing, um, whether or not that's going to be a problem for us. We we have content that's expensive and we find people reselling it all the time, so we don't want to open ourselves up to that kind of activity. Um, you know, referral URL I kind of hear is dead. That's like, you know, basically you hit a database from a specific URL uh, and that authenticates you. Um, there are certainly some other things in the works that, you know, I keep hearing about, but nothing is too far along besides the SAML is certainly the thing that right now people are talking about. Uh, and what, you know, the great thing about it is there's no more IP address maintenance, which is for some companies just impossible or they can't share it at all. I am for one, I'm question. so glad to hear that. <laughs> yes, you did. Thank you very much. And I don't know if you saw, but um, um, somebody on the, who was that? Higher up, or was it uh, Rachel? Was, no, Whitney was um, telling you that she was in Taiwan and is learning Chinese. And Evan would like to know what you're doing when you're not traveling. <laughs> Sleeping? <laughs> no, <laughs> I just came back from <laughs> I just came back from Ireland on Friday, and I leave for Italy on Friday. So I travel a lot, and um, I do a lot of reading when I'm traveling because I'm on a plane a lot. Um, and then when I'm relaxing, I'm working on my beautiful, uh, you know. 1927 Northeast Portland area home, <laughs> and um, I also play music sometimes. I play the mandolin and the violin, <laughs> so I keep busy. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, there's a lot of <laughs> it, discovery tools. That is a whole other combination. I mean, I, I would love it if I think we have a paper there. I think me and my team could probably give a paper uh, at uh, either ASWE or SLA or something about how we approached um, those discovery vendors because they didn't necessarily feel like they needed to talk to us. And we're very glad they did because I think we're the first publisher to make some headway there about you know, what the implications of discovery are going to be on, on individual publishers and students that don't even know you know, what they're really doing and searching when they hit a discovery search. So that is another topic, though, but um, we can talk about it sometime over coffee, perhaps. <laughs> Absolutely, and I'm definitely going to be checking out your website to see what you have published there. Thank you. Yeah, sure. All right, it looks like we're at the hour mark now. I think that uh, Dr. Fisher wanted to... Uh, Yes, thanks. Thanks, Brian. First of all, I want to thank Rachel again for uh, spending some time with us and, and giving us uh, her insights on um, her path to a uh, sort of alternative or non-traditional career with her uh, MLS background. And um, for those of you that are that are interested in this, I mean, Rachel. Uh, started off saying that this is her perspective and, and on uh, what happened to her, uh, and there's as many different perspectives as there are people working in alternative environments. And just today, SLA announced uh, they've been running a series of uh, what they're calling Twitter talks, and just today they announced that the next Twitter talk, which will be on the 18th of March, is going to be on this very topic. So I wanted to make everybody aware of that. Uh, it, it went out on a number of listservs today. If you didn't see that announcement yourself, uh, there's actually an announcement about it on the main SLA webpage, uh, sla.org. Uh, you can uh, find out about it, when it's going to happen, how to log into those. 
and it's, it's um, again the 18th of March. It's at noon uh, Pacific Coast time. Um, and if you can't make it, I do believe they have been archiving these uh, talks so you can go back and read the uh, Twitter streams if you're unable to join it live and see what some other people have said about uh, their paths to uh, careers outside of a traditional library environment. So I just wanted to make everybody aware of that. And again, thank you for your participation this evening. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, uh, everybody. And um, I will send Basha, I'll send you the presentation so if people ask for it, you can have it. Thank you very much. And um, I also wanted to say, a uh, seconding what Dr. Fisher was just telling us, I do have that um, information about the about the Twitter uh, sem seminar, and I will be sending it out to everybody who's already on our mailing list. So if you are not on the mailing list and would like to join SLA, please email us either from our website or um, probably that would be the easiest thing. And I'm going to paste that address here right now. And thank you so much, Rachel, and thank you, everybody, for coming. It was a great webinar. All right. Good night, everybody. Good, Good night, night, Rachel. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Good night. Uh, Dr. Fisher, did you want to stop the recording?